Okay, and just to review, when you have excess O2 present, like when the stomata get closed, the Rubisco enzyme is going to react with oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, and it forms a molecule of 3-phosphoglycerate and 2-phosphoglycolate, and this guy has to go all over the world inside the plant cell to be reconverted back to 3-phosphoglycerate. Really inefficient and not good for producing sugar. So our stomata are regulating transpiration within the plant or this gas water exchange, right? So when the leaf door is open, you get good exchange with carbon dioxide and oxygen. The Rubisco enzyme can act more efficiently to help make our glucose molecules. But when you have dehydration and you've got too much transpiration and too much water loss, the plant has to close the stomata to inhibit the water loss so it doesn't wilt. Um, this will inhibit photosynthesis and it, it causes an induction of the shunt pathway of Rubisco activity because oxygen is going to build up from the light reactions and the inability to have gas exchange. Carbon dioxide will also go down because the Calvin cycle is active and you are utilizing it in the Calvin cycle uh, with the Rubisco enzyme. So once that goes down and your oxygen's up, the Rubisco enzyme will continue to make uh, products with the oxygen present. So how do some plants uh, cope with this? You know, so plants that live in really arid regions and have to have their stomata closed a lot, they wouldn't be able to do very well if they only had the standard processes of producing sugar, right? The normal, and this is called the C3 pathway. So uh, C3 stands for three carbons, right? The glyceraldehyde three phosphate, right? So C3 pathway is just using the glyceraldehyde three phosphate to produce the sugar molecules. There's two other pathways called CAM and C4 pathways. Um, so this, like the name implies, is four carbon intermediate, right? And these are other strategies to help limit the side reaction of Rubisco. It also can help trap carbon dioxide inside the leaf tissue. And then if the leaf cells can trap more of that carbon dioxide during gas exchange time, it can then close the stomata during the day when it's really hot, and it can slowly release that carbon dioxide to the Rubisco enzyme and keep photosynthesis going forward. And so these are some of the strategies that plants use to overcome this problem when they're in really arid regions. C3 plant metabolism, again, is three carbon intermediates being utilized to make glucose. These plants essentially do not have any additional modifications to the Calvin cycle that increase the efficiency of carbon fixation, right? This is the standard general evolution, evolutionary pathway that most plants have undergone. C3 carbon fixation is just this metabolic pathway for carbon fixation that we've talked about. It converts carbon dioxide and ribulose bisphosphate into these two 3-carbon, three 3-phosphoglycerate three molecules. This reaction occurs in all plants, and it's the first step of the Calvin cycle. And uh, for the C3 plants, this is the only pathway that you have to create sugar. So C3 plants tend to thrive in areas where sunlight intensity and temperatures are moderate. Right, you have carbon dioxide concentrations that are at least at 200 parts per million or higher. I doubt there's any place on the earth right now that is that low. So everywhere, <laughs> right? But you want moderate temperatures as well so that you can leave the stomata open and have transpiration going on all of the time. So groundwater also um, needs to be plentiful so that if you have transpiration going on, you have water to replace the water that gets lost. So C3 plants represent about 95% of Earth's plant biomass, and they typically lose about 97% of the water that's taken up through their roots through this transpiration process. So essentially, plants are sweating all the time. So what is this C4 plant metabolism then? 
So C4 fixation is considered to be an advancement over our simpler and more ancient C3 carbon fixation mechanism that operates in most plants. So these plants have um, evolved a little bit more in this pathway to be able to sequester carbon dioxide during nighttime or during certain times um, so that it can hold it in there in a C4 molecule until it's required to be released for the Calvin cycle during the day. This requires more energy input um, than the C3 pathway in the form of ATP. So it's not as efficient in generating sugar molecules. It requires more energy, but you can do it when you have to close the stomata due to transpiration. So C4 plants separate rubisco from atmospheric oxygen um, and they fix the carbon in the mesophyll cells and using oxaloacetate and malate to ferry the fixed carbon to rubisco. So we know oxaloacetate and malate from the Krebs cycle, right? These uh, intermediates are also very useful to help shuttle our fixed carbon. Right, so these are four carbon units, right, um, that you already know from the Krebs cycle. So this is the definition for our C4 plants. We're using these molecules to carry and transport the carbon dioxide. So the rest of the Calvin cycle enzymes are isolated in what are called bundle sheath cells, and we make um, these intermediate compounds. Uh, that contain four carbon atoms, the oxaloacetate and malate, and that's why it's named C4. So let's take a look at these species to kind of see in a little more detail where this is happening. So in our C4 plants, carbon dioxide is collected and it's stored as oxaloacetate or malate within the mesophyll cells. So here you can see the mesophyll cells are here. They're kind of located in these spaces. You can see they're near the stomata, right, the mesophyll. And so you've got a lot, when the stomata is open, you've got a lot of gas exchange, you've got oxygen going out, and you've got carbon dioxide coming in. So if this is nighttime, right, you can open the stomata, it's cooler outside, and then you can have uh, carbon dioxide coming in. It'll get trapped in the mesophyll cells and a carboxylase will combine it with something like maybe pyruvate to make oxaloacetate. Hmm, have you seen that reaction before? I think you have. Look at gluconeogenesis again. Well, that happens inside these mesophyll cells. And so you're making these molecules of oxaloacetate and malate, and they're essentially storing that carbon dioxide, right? So um, these C4 compounds are then transported into the bundle sheath cells, which are here around the xylem and phloem. That's handy because if you're going to be making your sugar molecules, you can dump them into the phloem where they can be taken down to the root systems of the plants, right? So the organization of the leaf tissue um, really helps the Calvin cycle. It also helps in being able to sequester oxygen um, when it's produced during the light reactions, right? So you want to keep it away as much as possible from rubisco. And if we take a little bit of a deeper look here, you can see here we have our phosphoenopyruvate carboxylase taking phosphoenopyruvate adding a molecule of uh, CO2 and forming our molecule of, right, the gas exchange coming in here, molecule of oxaloacetate. If we reduce this, we will form malate, and malate can be shuttled across the membranes, right, just like our aspartate malate shuttle that we saw in the mitochondria. So you have to reduce the oxaloacetate to move it around, it's got to go to malate so that it can be shuttled, gets shuttled from the mesophyll cells down to the bundle sheath cells. It gets reconverted into pyruvate here and releases that carbon dioxide in the bundle sheath cells. That carbon dioxide can then be utilized by the rubisco enzyme in the Calvin cycle. 
This pyruvate molecule gets reconverted into phosphoenopyruvate um, by our pyruvate phosphate dikinase, and it gets shuttled back to the mesophyll cells where it can do that cyclic process again. Pretty cool. So this whole evolutionary pathway has been developed in these C4 types of plants. So overall, C4 metabolism consumes more energy because we have to fix carbon dioxide twice, right? It's being fixed first by the PEP carboxylase and then to make the oxaloacetate, and then it's gotta be released from that molecule, and then it's fixed again by the Rubisco enzyme. So in C4 metabolism, it takes 30 ATP molecules to make one glucose molecule, rather than the 18 ATP molecules required for C3 metabolism. So C4 plants have a competitive advantage under conditions of drought, high temperatures, and nitrogen or carbon dioxide limitation, but they can't compete in more moderate temperate areas with the C3 plants because of this demand. So what types of plants are C4 plants? Um, so C4 carbon fixation has evolved up to 40 times in different groups of plants independently. So this is an example of convergent evolution, right? It just is required for plants to be able to grow in these very dry environments. Um, they represent about 5% of the Earth's plant biomass and about 1% of the known plant species. However, they account for about 30% of terrestrial carbon fixation. That's pretty crazy, right? And this is because they represent food crops for us. So these species typically are highly concentrated in the tropics where air temperature contributes to higher possible levels of the oxygenase activity of rubisco. And this increases uh, rates of photorespiration in C3 plants. So C4 plants can have an advantage in these environments. Sugarcane, maize, and sorghum are all examples of C4 plants. So this is again why we have 30% of terrestrial carbon fixation going on with these plants because of our slant to growing these types of plants. So there also is CAM metabolism or crassulation acid metabolism. This CAM photosynthesis is a more elaborate carbon fixation pathway that occurs in some plants. So these plants will fix carbon dioxide during the night, store it as our four carbon acid um, malate, doing the same thing with the PEP carboxylase and making oxaloacetate first. So the CO2 then gets released during the day where it's concentrated around the Rubisco enzyme and it increases the efficiency of photosynthesis. The CAM pathway then allows the stomata to remain shut during the day and therefore it's really common in plants that are adapted to these arid conditions. So C4 plants can be more in the tropical zones um, where you have uh, kind of the heavy air uh, that doesn't have good transpiration going on and you get accumulation of oxygen around Rubisco. So it differs from the C4 metabolism, which is spatially concentrating CO2 around Rubisco, shuttling it from the mesophyll cells to the bundle sheath cells. Okay, and uh, succulent, many succulents have the CAM metabolism and things like pineapples also have this metabolism. All right, and so we'll end this section just talking a little bit about carbon storage in plants. We talked about carbon storage in the liver with the form of glycogen, right? And this is just reviewing that same type of pathway in uh, plants. So you can uh, make sucrose in plants. This is made from fructose, combining it with a UDP glucose. So the glucose is here, molecule of UDP here. The UDP acts as a good leaving group, and you can join the uh, fructose and the glucose together, forming sucrose 6-phosphate. So plants like sugarcane and stuff can uh, store this molecule, and we like to eat it. So sucrose is one major form of sugar in plants, and starch is going to be the other. 
And so we have two types of starch. This is just review from what you did earlier in the term, the amylose and the amylopectin, right? Amylose is just the linear alpha-1-4 bonds linked in a large polymer of glucose. This accounts for about 30% of the starch stored in the plants. And then amylopectin has some of the branching at the 1-6 uh, positions. And just it's not as highly branched as glycogen is, maybe about every 25 or 30 residues, you'll have an alpha-1-6 linkage. And this accounts for about 70% of the starch that's stored in plants. All right, and that is where we will end our adventure of plants.